It's time for the SLMA Radio Show with your host today, me, Susan Finch. So glad you're here. I'm Susan Finch here for SLMA Radio from theslma.com and our radio station, which is slmaradio.com. I am here today with Bonnie Crater. If you watched our show, I think it was a couple weeks ago, she was on, she's the CEO of Full Circle CRM, but we are going to have a major discussion on gender equality in the C-space. So, Bonnie, let's dive right in. Sounds great. Thanks, Susan. Let's give, you know, what prompted your passion for this? And I have a feeling, you know, as a woman that's, you know, owns a company, this has been a slow burn for you that's been building and building. But what was the moment of crescendo for you that you said, this is ridiculous. We need more women in this area. Well, it actually started um, uh, this past year after I raised my Series A. Uh, we got a loan from Silicon Valley Bank. Thank you very much, Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, I was invited to a Silicon Valley Bank event. And uh, I was excited. It was going to be at Oracle's, my former employer. The, the new co-CEO was presenting. It's going to be great. And um, so I, um, I arrive at the, the very fancy, you know, Oracle uh, c- customer visit center, and um, there's, you know, a hundred CEOs in the room. And I look around, and there's myself and one other woman who's a CEO and 98 guys. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I didn't really, actually, I didn't, it was, it was an epiphany for me. I, I actually didn't realize, you know, I heard the statistics, but I didn't really realize that it was really true. Um, that there were so few women CEOs. I thought, oh my God, this is this is sort of nutty. H- how could this possibly be? And then I started uh, doing some uh, reading. I learned about uh, a study, the, the Babson College study. What they were saying is that um, in 1999, there were uh, 10% of all of this, the venture capital partners were uh, women. Um, but by 2012, only 6% were women. And I thought, hmm, this is this direction is not going in the right direction. And then I, uh, coming back to the Silicon Valley Bank event, uh, I also read that 2.7% of companies uh, had women CEOs that were getting funding from venture capitalists. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is kind of a crazy situation. I, I, I actually didn't really, really think about it. I didn't really grok it. I didn't really internalize the fact that it was unusual for me to be a woman and being a CEO. Well, that, that brings up a really good point though, Bonnie, because you know we hear about gender equality and we need more women, but the women I've interviewed in the past on this show, you know, Juliana Lukasak, who's a producer and director for movies and some of the others, they didn't even, they never thought about it. It's just that I'm going to do this, not I, the woman, am going to do this. I'm gonna do this. And do you right. think that's part of the thinking that's getting in people's way. I, I'm not really sure about that, but I do know that um, a lot there are, it's not an uncommon experience of what I had of, of um, all of a sudden realizing that you're the only woman in the room. <laughs> so, so that prompted me, I, I kind of got to be in my bonnet because I did talk to a lot of men when I was raising money and I talked to very few women. Um, um, I thought, you know, there's got to be something something that we can do about this. And uh, I have a friend, her name is Patty Murray, and she just retired uh, from Intel, running Intel's HR department. Uh, she was a senior vice president there, so she was an executive there. And she, uh, in her last years there, she studied this problem. She studied the problem of why, why weren't more women rising to the top ranks at Intel? And so she hired a consulting firm and uh, the first first uh, study she did, they came back with sort of the, the standard answers. Oh, women are too aggressive or women are not aggressive enough or, um, you know, like it's all very confusing. <laughs> so they, uh, so she uh, asked those guys to, um, to depart. Um, she fired them. And then she hired a second group and they came up with sort of similar answers. And so she decided to take a, 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 the lead from the NFL and the NFL has had a big problem um, 10, 15 years ago. And the problem was that the 70% of all of the players in the NFL were African-American, but very few of the coaches were African-American. And so what they decided to do was to implement this um, rule called the Rooney Rule, 
which was named after Mr. Rooney, who was associated with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right. And the and the Rooney Rule basically said they required the the teams in the NFL to interview at least one African American for every coaching and general manager position. What happened was the number of coaches in the NFL went from six percent to um, a high, I guess, of 22 percent. So it had a real effect um, on increasing the number of African-American coaches. And if you've watched, if you're a football fan, if you've watched NFL football, um, you'll, you know, it used to be very rare that you saw an African-American coach. And now it's not, it's pretty, you know, it's common. It's not considered unusual to have an African-American coach. So it really had a big effect. And so uh, when Patty was introducing this concept to Intel, she was, you know, talking to the Intel executives, talking, to, telling them about the Rooney Rule and how that had a very positive effect. And she thought that um, that that it would be a, a great idea for Intel to uh, to try this inside. And so they nicknamed the program the Murray Mandate. That was kind of, a, I guess, an internal joke inside Intel. But um, the Murray Murray Mandate Rule basically said, uh, for any senior position that we have open at Intel, we're going to interview two women so that women get consideration. Because it turns out that in the NFL, it wasn't that the skill set was lacking in the African-American coaches. It was just the access to the job. And once they once there was access to the job, they African-Americans were being considered. They performed equally as well as, as the uh, white men. Um, in fact, uh, three years after they implemented that Rooney rule, there was a Super Bowl that had two African-American coaches that faced off each other. So, and today at Intel, I don't know what the stats are at Intel, I can't tell you, but um, I, I did notice that on their executive team, there's a woman president. And that's the first time I've noticed that in a, um, ever in the history of Intel. So that's really cool. Okay, so we've translated that with minorities and I get that. Mm-hmm. Being, you know, taken advantage growing up and my family did of, you know, the, the, Hey, we're half Hispanic. Um, you know, <laughs> we took advantage of we could on that. And I got lots of scholarships that I turned down uh, just because they were too far away. But as far as women getting the interviews, I mean, that's, you're bringing up a good point. It isn't just a matter of, yes, we'll interview more. <clears throat> so getting them in the door first, as far as that much, I'm understanding that, that a lot of companies don't even look any further because they're asking their friends, they're asking their peers, they're asking other people already in the position, who would they recommend? Well, if they're men that are in that position, they hang out with their buddies and they're going to recommend that unless you push them. Right. And, and I think that becomes that comfort zone as, as you saw, especially with VCs and some of the other, you know, financial related industries, even more, I think, than tech. It has that appearance still, that good old boy network. Yeah, I like to think of it as tribal. You know, there's all those books on tribal this and tribal that. Um, And when a VC is investing in a company, it's not like they just give the money and then walk away. Right. This is, they are investing in a company and there's there's a relationship. They're investing in a relationship in the CEO. And, you know, if you're, it's only natural that people will, want to develop relationships with people that are similar to them. And so because there's so many more men than women in, uh, in, this, in the venture capital world, it's only natural that that would happen, that, uh, that very few women would, would get funding. And so it seems very natural that um, this you know, phenomena would happen, not just in uh, large Silicon Valley firms, but also in venture capital firms as well. And that's why the Murray Rule Murray mandate is such a cool idea because it doesn't require, it's not a quota, right? It's not, it doesn't require a venture capitalist to hire a woman, right? But what it does do is it, it asks a venture capitalist or a CEO or a, a chairman of the board to, to, if they have an open position that they would consider a woman candidate. And so it just creates uh, opportunity for women to get exposure to those positions and be considered. And if the, the Rudy rule holds up, it actually works. Once the individuals are considered, they become candidates and, uh, and they uh, have a high, higher chance of being hired. Well, what's the percentage of women versus men in the world? It's pretty doggone even. So, you know, to just you say, we're just going to consider, well, let's do more than consider. Let's, you know, not just say we're going to interview one or two. Let's, you know, up it percentage wise, let's do half and half. Why not? you might have to dig further to look for these candidates. 
why aren't people stepping up to take it that extra step further when there's that high of a percentage of women in the world? Well, it's just easier. It's easier to uh, hire people. It's easier to work with people that are similar to yourselves. It takes extra effort to actually find candidates that have some sort of diversity that are different from yourself. And so that's why the Murray mandate is such a great idea because it basically puts a rule in place that says, hey, um, let's, let's make sure that we're considering other genders. Right. And I, and I appreciate that. And I, I get that. But for the companies that are saying, okay, I'm going to step up and do this. Why would they stop at just saying, I'm just going to consider, why not? Let's even this out a little bit more. And yes, it's going to take us longer to find more candidates because we're not getting them from word of mouth like we used to. We need to look in other resources and check with other people that we know to look for another candidate that might not be a man anymore, <laughs> might be a woman. Yeah, and um, there's companies out there that are um, that are doing this. In fact, um, I had a communication with Phil Fernandez. He's CEO oh, of a yes. company called Marketo. Marketo. Yes, we um, and if you're in sales lead management, um, <laughs> you probably Anything. know Phil. Yeah, you probably know Phil because he runs Marketo, uh, which is um, a very popular marketing automation system. And um, and Phil uh, communicated uh, with um, uh, Jim Obermeyer and myself. Um, that he uh, thinks the Murray mandate doesn't, and the Rooney rule, those kinds of rules don't go far enough. He's trying to get half of his executive staff to be men and half of them to be women. Awesome. Yeah, that's can great. You imagine the, can you imagine though the tone and the input that that would change and bring? That's really exciting. When you think of the new ideas that would come from that type of mix to keep companies from getting stale, from staying behind, when you start to kind of stir it up a little bit more. Yeah, and once you have those leaders in, in position, it gives role models for uh, for young people to say, hey, it is possible for me to grow to a senior level position. It's not going to be so unusual for a woman to have a senior position at a company and uh, and to be CEO and be on the board. It's uh, Right now, it's unusual. And so we need to create um, a change where it's not unusual. And, you know, good on Phil, right? Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you for stepping up and saying, hey, this is not enough. We're going to do more. That's great. I think that's great. And some people don't have to start with baby steps. If you don't have anything in place now, starting with anything is going to help. That's right. But be ready to ramp it up because we're going to be challenging you to do it <laughs> and bring it all forward. We're going to take a quick station identification break. I'm Susan Finch. I am the host today on SLMA Radio. I'm here with my guest today, Bonnie Crater, a full circle CRM. And we are talking about what's affectionately known as the Murray Mandate. And it's a pretty serious mandate, actually. It's challenging gender equality at the C space level for executives in all companies, large, small, tech, financial, we don't care. It's time to even it out. So, Bonnie, here we are back. There were a few things that were expressed, um, and I believe it was by Patty. She made some really interesting statements that I was hoping to get your feedback on. And isolation affects women's advancement more than we think. What does that mean to you? This is what I think she means. Uh, isolation at the, is, uh, is common at the highest levels because oftentimes women in these positions are the only woman in the room. And it's very difficult to, um, uh, uh, to, um, con to develop um, um, a well-rounded and real relationship with this group of guys when they are part of one tribe and you are part of another tribe. And so, again, it goes, for me, it goes back to this, the, tr the, the tribal nature of these relationships, which is, um, uh, and, uh, and the guys, um, when they're together, oftentimes they don't know that they're behaving in this tribal way and not being inclusive of maybe the only woman in the room. Oh, you mean sophomoric? Um, no, just joking. <laughs> Mar Maria Pergolino, um, I remember she was on a Lead Space radio show a while ago, and she was even talking about the transition from being at one level position and everything's going great. And she's used to working with her team and doing all these things. And when she went to the next level, it became very lonely. And it wasn't just lonely because she was a woman, 
but suddenly you don't have that same team around you either. And for, I think for women, especially we're used to gathering up our village, gathering up our, you know, our friends, <clears throat> the people we can count on our sisters, whatever it is, our family. And in departments, my experience has been that, you know, it becomes your, basically your work family. And when you're ripped from it and move it to the next level, sometimes that's scary for a lot of people to adjust to. And I think to a degree, men adjust to that better. That's just my experience. Maybe I'm off on that. Um, you, may, you may very well be right. Um, I, um, I, I do think that, um, uh, uh, that lots of people want to create environments in which they are comfortable to work in. And so that's, I think, the primary reason why we have some of these discrepancies where, um, uh, where, where, um, you know, women are feeling feeling isolated. Right. <clears throat> there was a, another thing that, um, and I really I resonate with this one especially, ambition and how it's expressed often looks very different in women. Yeah, uh, a lot of women are are big on saying I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, I'm sorry that I said I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that I said I'm sorry. Anyway, the, a lot of a lot of people are, are and w women in particular are um, are big on saying I'm sorry, and um, and the reason that they I believe that they do that is to really not call too much attention to themselves and to be perceived as ambitious. Um, and you know this is this is unfortunate. Um, every everybody should have the right to be ambitious. I think it's in the, isn't that in the Declaration of Independence? Yes. <laughs> Maybe four women could vote. Yeah. Um. <laughs> to, uh, you know, to have the right to pursue uh, happiness. Right. Um, and so everyone should have the, the right to be ambitious and that should, that should be a, a right for men only. Part of it, I, I don't know if, you know, for me, I'm in a, a tech environment, <clears throat> I'm perceived as a geek you know, as a web person, as a geek, as a code nerd, and get us, I get lumped in with the, the stereotypical greasy haired, you know, tape on the glasses rim kind of pimply face people. And it, that's just, you know, what happens in my, you know, people meet me, it's like, oh, wow, that's what you do. And I think sometimes we have labeled ourselves, women have labeled themselves, allowed ourselves to be labeled. And I don't think it's the, the men, I think the men just get in bad habits, but they take our lead on what we permit them to label us as. And it's like you were just saying with the apologies, when you get in those bad habits, how are you ever going to assert yourself with confidence to say, I'm going for that job. I'm going for that position. And I'm going to do everything I can because I am the best candidate. How are we going to get them to break? You know, it isn't just to having the opportunity. It comes at the other end as well, that if they're not going to step up and demand, not just, can I please, if they aren't going to demand it, why would anybody listen to them? So uh, there's some recent statistics uh, from some studies that were done at Duke University, which um, look at um, job descriptions. This is kind of interesting. So the, uh, the job descriptions that we produce today often have requ requirements for the job, right? And you might have six or seven different job requirements. It turns out that uh, if you're, um, when a woman is looking at those six or seven requirements, they feel like they need to have all seven requirements in order to apply for the job. But, um, when a man looks at the, the, uh, the job requirements, you know, one or two are sufficient and they're applying for the job. So this is something that, um, is just sort of inherent in the way, um, women respond to even a simple thing like a job description. So if you, it turns out if you have too many requirements for the job, you'll have fewer women applying for the job. So if you write your, the way we all write our job descriptions, we put six or seven requirements on it. That's what we, that's sort of the standard. Um, but if you are um, uh, writing, uh, writing a job description that you want to have a lot more women applying for, um, have fewer requirements. <laughs> Never thought of that. I, I yeah. would have never thought of that, but I understand it. I, and you know, speaking from my daughter, she's 13, and she was considering going out for the little local 
city cheer squad. And she says, oh, I didn't want to try out because they said I had to do backflips and handsprings and this and that. She says, I can't do that. So, but I've seen those girls and they don't do that. She says, I'm really good at these other things. I said, do you want to be in it or not? She said, no, but I know I could. <laughs> so it was an interesting transformation, even at that age, to watch her thinking, you know, thinking she wasn't good enough because she did not meet all the requirements. And she right. was trying to so, be honest and the rule follower. And I don't want to waste their time if I can't do those things. Right. And that's a self-worth so, thing. Right. Um, so um, as, as uh, hiring managers, though, that we can actually take a concrete step. We can, you know, agree to the to the Murray mandate and just was to interview more women candidates. Um, and we can also write our job descriptions where we're describing what the job is in order to get more women candidates. You just put fewer fewer, fewer requirements in, and you'll and you'll get more women candidates. It could be as simple as just formatting it with more descriptive paragraph, but then fewer bullets. Because I think it's the bullets everybody kind of focuses on. Mm -hmm. To see, because they can check it off their list. I have that, have that, have yeah, that, have that, have that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think we, I think we've given people something to think about from both ends. Women, you know, you need to demand more and have a little more self-confidence because chances are you are qualified for a lot more than you think you are. And companies, we've got to open up our opportunities and not just go with the easy, you know, fish in the barrel for your candidates. It's time to expand, to challenge yourselves, and to make it be a policy. Is that, I mean, those are pretty good baby steps, don't you think? Oh, I would think so. And I, um, I have a challenge. I have a challenge for CEOs. I have a challenge for uh, the venture capital general partners out there. Uh, sign up and take the Murray Mandate Pledge. When you have an open senior position in your firm or in your company, you know, consider two women for that position. And you'll make a big difference in the world and for your company. And can we find that pledge on your site? Yeah, we have a site that's going up shortly. Uh, it uh, will be at www.murraymandate.org. Okay, murraymandate.org, folks. We will put that in the show description and we will put that right here. See it? It's right there. You can go right there and go ahead and take the pledge. So... I want to thank you, Bonnie, for coming back and for getting so involved with the Sales and Management Association. You are a true asset. You are a role model and inspiration to show women and girls and people in general that we can do better. Well, anything is possible. Just remember that. All right. So if you want to find Bonnie, you can find her at fullcirclecrm.com. Look for her in the usual places such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Google+. And for me... You can find me at theslma.com 